interaction of the brains by an example, but scientists are strongly in the world today. And this is strongly in a nutshell. If you want to know more about our activities, you can have a look at our website. And there we share it in detail. But what I personally like most about Sonia is that there is a lot of room for your own initiative. I know from my experience that if you have an idea that makes sense, of course, you get the opportunity to realize it. And that's a nice uh, bridge to today's speaker, Richie, who had a very bright idea and named it Polars. And uh, in the upcoming six months, he gets the opportunity to bring Polars to the next level. I know Itchy as a very smart and driven individual, a bit crazy, and definitely someone who doesn't take no for an answer. Annoyed by the inefficiency of PAMAS, which is the Python library for data manipulation and analysis, he decided to uh, make a better version of it, as we now know by the name of Polars. I will not spoil any details, so uh, let's dive into it. And uh, this is also a moment to unmute yourself and give Itchy a warm welcome. It's almost uh, real. Not. Uh, I always feel a bit insane by talking to my laptop, but uh, this helps. Well, welcome. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Polars. Polars um, is a new kit on the block, on the very saturated uh tool landscape of data frame libraries um but i will show you today that it still has something to offer um so yeah short introduction about me um yeah richie fink i'm a machine learning engineer at xomnia um i have a blog um if you want to know more about what uh keeps me from the streets go to the blog and uh, take a look um, yeah, we had the in info about Xomnia by Lizanne, so uh, I'm not going to do that anymore, but um, I want to mention that Xomnia is uh, sponsoring the Polar's data frame project. So um, this is very cool. We can uh, take Polar's to the next level and uh, the next six months uh, I can spend my, uh, uh, my time on it and uh, make it better. So uh, yeah. Um, today I'm going to talk about Polus. I also want to have a notable mention. Uh, I believe he's one of the attendees. I don't know if he's in the call, but um, Daniel here has also uh, contributed to, contributed to Polars and uh, 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 initiated a very cool thing, um, um, an optimizer framework that is similar to Spark's Catalyst optimizer. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I just want to mention it. So, yeah, let's continue. So, a bit about the history. Um, this all started um, like a year ago, when um, in March, when the when the lockdown started. Uh, the, the the status was that I had a few pet projects in Rust uh, under my belt. Um, and I was using Rust a lot. Um, at my work in the back end, I was missing a data frame library. I was I wanted to read in some files, uh, do a group by, and it felt a bit um, uh, yeah, it felt a bit tedious to do this by to implement this by hand and just for that for that one project. Um, and I was interested in the Arrow project. Uh, we will talk about Arrow later uh, in this presentation. If you don't know what it is, uh, we'll get to that. Uh, but it's incubated by the author of Pandas. Um, yeah, and I was in the lockdown. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it turned out I was inside for a long time. I could use pet project. So maybe I could, maybe I can write a data frame library myself. That was sort of the, the idea, but I didn't do it Think about it too serious. Once more, okay, can I do it as a pet project? Um, um, so I started doing some research about the status quo. Uh, there are some things. Um, uh, yeah, don't make the mistakes other tools have. So, so yeah, see what you have. And I, I came up uh, the eleven things Wes McKinney hates about pandas. Uh, for the one who don't know, Wes McKinney is the author of Pandas. 
Um, and he didn't like those things. Uh, one, the internals are, are too far, far from the middle. Um, I marked it in orange and um, this means we can we have solved this by implementing this in Rust. Rust is a low level programming language, which is close to the middle. Uh, actually, we can do anything we want, uh, similar to C. Um, note that some, some issues are uh, solved by a combination of those three, but I, um, I marked it with the most important one. Uh, there's no support for memory map data sets. This is also not there in Polars. Uh, poor performance in database and file ingest uh, export. Um, this is solved by Arrow. Arrow has got very good performance on this issue. This is one of the reasons uh, Arrow was designed. Uh, there is very warty missing data support. If you uh, actually Pandas has hacked the the uh, the float the floating non value, not a number value, as being a missing data value. Uh, so if you want integer data and you want missing data, you need to cast these integers to floats, and they have some hacky things to uh, to do this. That's why it's warty. Um, yeah, this is also so also solved by Arrow. Uh, there's a lack of transparency memory use, RAM man management. Yeah, this is uh, solved in Rust. We can do whatever we want. Uh, weak support for categorical data. Uh, I solved it in Rust, but we can also, it's also solved by Arrow. Um, yeah, the group buys are slow uh, and awkward. Yeah, we solved this by writing efficient algorithms from scratch. Um, Appending data to a data frame is tedious and very costly. In Polars, this is uh, actually super cheap um, by efficient algorithms and data structures. Um, there is limited non-extensible type metadata because Pandas is sort of, uh, yeah, it's, um, um, it has to do, it, it, it <coughs> Pandas is sort of, Tied together with NumPy, and NumPy isn't meant as a database or data frame type system. So uh, they needed to hack, about, hack around NumPy a little bit. Um, there's an eager evaluation mo model, no query planning. So if you do a query in the database, the database will optimize this query and see how it can do this query in the most or a more optimal form. In Pandas, everything is eager, so everything is executed on the fly and if you write a very expensive query, it will do a very expensive query. We have solved this with efficient algorithms um, and slow limited multicore algorithms in Pandas. Um, I think multicore algorithms are almost non-existent. And we also uh, solve this by efficient algorithms. Um, so yeah, I think we we have, I, <laughs> we could have, uh, 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 we we took a lot of the of the list of ten things Wes McKinney hates about pandas, so maybe he likes polars a little bit more. I don't know. Um, yeah, the arrow format. So this is the other part of the research. Okay, what what will my, what will me, my um, memory format be? Um, I was interested in arrow. What arrow promises is um, a memory format that can be shared with any process uh, on the same machine. Um, I've read that, for instance, in Spark, um, going from Spark to Pandas, they do that on the same node. They still have to pickle a lot of data. So, so um, and also going from Spark over the wire to another machine, they uh, have to serialize the data into JSON or another serialization format. And on the other end, they need to deserialize this data. And this amounts to, approximately 25% of compute. So this is very, uh, yeah, this is very uh, expensive to do. Um, if you do this in the process, so not within machines, um, actually all memory formats in different programming language like Pandas, um, and, uh, no, just different programming languages, Python, Panda, Python Rust, C, uh, C++, Java, they often all have their own memory representation. So if you need to send something to another process, um, you need to copy that data over the 
to the process, and this is expensive. What Arrow aims to do is uh, have one central Arrow memory, and we can just swap pointers around. And a pointer is so, oh, hey, my data is just on this position, and uh, you can read it, and, and it's yours. Uh, another thing that Arrow does is um, um, it stores data uh, column-oriented, and column-oriented data is often more uh, cache-friendly than row-oriented data. That's because we um, uh, we query data more often in a column-oriented manner than in row-oriented manner. Um, Spark, for instance, has row-oriented data, which is not very cache-efficient. Uh, what cache efficiency is, we will see in, uh, in the next few slides. Um, but it's important for performance. That's, in, that's important to know. Um, so this is a, um, a small introduction about Arrow. So I decided, OK, I want to have this data frame library with Arrow as memory model. Um, and after one year of programming, OK, what did we got? Um, we resulted in a blazingly fast data frame library. Uh, it's written in Rust. It's got um, uh, a wrapper, a wrapper um, library in Python. Um, and <clears throat> it's got copy on write semantics. This means we can clone data. So a whole, a whole column, a series is reference counted. We can just clone it. Uh, and it, it's, it's actually, it's almost free. It, doesn't cost you. It's like nanoseconds to clone, uh, to clone a to clone a series. Appends are very cheap, but due to this copy on write semantics, writes are expensive. If I need to write to a series, I first need to clone it, to copy it, and then I can write to it. Um, because if I have multiple copies which are reference counted, um, if I change one, I, ch I change uh, I change the data for everyone who has a copy, which is uh, not what we want. Um, it's got column-oriented data storage, which is very cache efficient, uh, which is very important for performance. It also doesn't has a, have a block manager. This is something what Pandas has. I'm not going to explain the block manager, but um, it makes your code slow and it gives you unpredictable performance. So if you do an, you add a column in Pandas, it can do a very expensive data copy without you knowing it. It doesn't do this very often, but for instance, after the 100th column you add, it will do that. Um, missing values are indicated with bit masks instead of nonce, because nonce are something different. So um, yeah, so we can uh, have nonce due to our floating point operations and have missing data, and they will always remain different, and we can make different decisions on them. Um, and allows for bit masks optimizations, which uh, I will get into later. Um, yeah, efficient multi-threaded algorithms and query optimization. Query optimizations are uh, done by every relational database system, um, and these are like, uh, yeah, very cool. This this makes sure th this is what makes Spark fast because if you don't do query optimization, you will likely do very uh, a lot of work that you didn't have to do. Um, SIMD vectorization, uh, we will get to that later. And we have NumPy and Pandas interoperability. Um, so what Polars is, it has an eager API, and everybody who takes a look at the eager API and knows Pandas knows what it does. It's, it's uh, almost an exact copy. There are some differences. Um, and it has a lazy API. And the lazy API is similar to Spark, if you look at it. Uh, it looks more SQL-like, it's more uh, declarative. I like it more, to be honest. Um, and this um, this gives me the full context of a query and I can make um, it generally is faster because I can do query optimization and um, um, it can make more informed decisions about what it should do, what it can optimize. Um, so we get in the Venn diagram, we get, we get we get a bit of pandas, we get a bit of Spark, and we get a bit of Arrow. And those three combined are, are polars. Um, and this resulted in one of the fastest data frame libraries uh, out there in the moment. It's the fastest available in Python. 
Um, this isn't my own benchmark because everybody likes a benchmark. So I chose the data frame uh, benchmark uh, hosted by uh, H2O AI, which is the only database uh, data frame benchmark I know. Um, there are these are the tools that are there. Our data table, which is very fast and um, which is still still is faster on the group buys. Clickhouse is an in-memory vectorized data frame or, or database um, system. Spark, Spark is run uh, on a single node in memory. Um, Deplier, I think you pronounce it like that. Uh, Pandas PyData table is a fast uh, implementation uh, for Python of data table. Um, um, data frames, uh, .gl, this is from Julia and some other tools. Um, and here we show, um, so the benchmark does 15 tasks, tasks of data of different cardinality and different sizes and different complexities. Uh, it does five join algorithms and it does 10 group by algorithms tasks. And the tasks are run on a cold cache. Uh, this is important because you almost always do a query once. And the first time you do a query, it's slowest because you don't have a, your CPU cache is still empty. What you see in this database, you see two runs, and only the first run counts. Uh, in the second run, you see the cache effect. So in the first run, it's slow. In the second run, it's a bit faster um, because the caches are, are hot. Um, as you can see, the joins in Polaris are the fastest available, and the group by is our second or third. So um, yeah, it's a very fast data frame library. Um, available in Python and Rust. Um, so yeah, how do we get there? Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to uh, go through some design decisions that made it fast. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything, um, but we're going to go uh, through a few. But before we do that, we need to uh, know our, our hardware. And this is important uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one, because um, the way hardware, uh, the state of the hardware in a point in time very much um, influences the design decisions you have to take on that time. Um, for instance, with rela relational database management systems, um, one um, uh, one uh, mechanism that was used a lot was the iterator or the volcano model, and this was a very, this was uh, sort of the fastest design you could do in that point in time. This was uh, this is a generation from the from the nineties. Uh, this was very reasonable when when we have hard disks that that are still slow and we have a low low RAM capacity. Uh, what this iterator do model does, it isn't factorized, but it um, for instance, with the join, with the with the join operation, it requests a tuple with indexes from the left table to the right table, and these are just function calls. So you uh, request tuples downwards until you have enough tuples to fill your limit, for instance. Um, and this was very reasonable in that time. And uh, doing anything vectorized wouldn't make make it faster because the uh, the bottleneck were the were the disk I/O. Um, Nowadays, we have large amounts of RAM. We have very wide uh, CPU caches. We have larger SIMD registers. So vectorized database systems um, are a sensible choice. And we see this happening in uh, relational database management system design. Uh, AWS Snowflake, vectorized ClickHouse, these are all instances of vectorized columnar push-based database, database systems. And those are like orders of magnitudes faster than Postgres or MySQL. Um, so what I want to argue is like uh, a redesign of tools uh, is for performance is uh, um, required if you want to have best performance in a, in a generation of hardware. And also algorithmic complexity cannot explain all performances. For instance, an array lookup uh, which is linear complexity can be faster than a hash table lookup, which is constant complexity, which doesn't make any sense if you take a look at it from time complexity. 
Um, but it can be faster. It's only up till uh, an n number of elements. I believe somewhere around the 200 or 300 elements. Um, but yeah, so you need to dive into the hardware to see if this, uh, which is actually faster. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I mentioned already, uh, caches are important. So I'm going to explain what cache hierarchies are. Um, do people know about this? I, what is the audience? Mostly Python R developers? Show me your language in the chat. Are there some C or Rust developers? Yes. JavaScript. Cool. Yeah. Okay, if you if you do something in Python, don't care about cache. It doesn't make sense. Um, you cannot even uh, have an intuition about cache in Python. But the the idea is, um, if your CPU wants to get data from uh, from the memory, it can get it on several level different levels of cache or from main memory, and those have all different access speeds. And uh, the hierarchies go from Main memory is the biggest, uh, and then you go to L3 cache, which is a bit smaller, and then to, but also a bit faster. Then you go to L2 cache, which is uh, even faster, but smaller again. And then you go to L1 cache, which is uh, very fast, but super small. And then you go to registers on the CPU itself, which are like the fastest, um, but they can only uh, hold one word, I believe. Um, <clears throat> So if you can design your hardware so such that you have as much cache hits as possible, like every time I need data, I can get uh, data from the L1 cache, which takes me three cycles, versus an algorithm that every iteration I need to get data from main memory, which takes me 100 to 300 cycles. My algorithm can be like 150 times slower. Um, this makes sense, right? Um, let's see how we get cache, uh, how we get data. So let's say we start with a cold cache. We have nothing in cache. So I'm looking at uh, this point here. We have nothing in cache. Oh, and I want to get the, uh, the blue data point. Uh, the CPU first goes to all the cache layers and has cache miss after cache miss, and then it goes to the blue data point, and we're, we've rated 300 uh, cycles, and then we get it, and it's stored in cache. But what we see is that not only the blue one is stored in cache, but also the green one. Uh, this is because cache is filled and deleted with cache lines. So cache lines are uh, often 64 bytes long, and if you Request data, you get the whole cache line. So in this case, we get this whole block of data in the cache. Um, and if we want to get the next, uh, the green one, we immediately have it in cache and we will have it in one or three cycles. So if you traverse an array linearly, it's very cache efficient. If you traverse an array and we skip a lot of cache lines, it's very slow. So for this reason, um, uh, it, it matters how you traverse, for instance, a matrix or row major order or uh, column major order, and it depends on how it's laid out in memory. Um, there's another important thing to uh, consider, which is branching. So a branch is um, any if statement in your code, um, any place in your code when you're, where you're dependent on a conditional uh, you can take path A or path B. Um, this is also the case with a with a with a loop with a while loop. Every time the loop can can um, uh, can be finished, and it needs to, to do another path. So, um, <clears throat> if a CPU gets an instruction, it needs to do um, different things. It needs to do a fetch, get the instruction, then it needs to decode the instruction. Then it needs to execute it, and then it needs to write back the result. Um, and if you would do that sequentially, we needed to wait for 
CPU things before this whole thing was, was done, before we could start the next instruction. So what the CPU does, it has got pipelines, and while it executes the first fetch, um, it can already execute it, um, the do the, uh, the the execution of the next part. So um, if you do the decode of the second step, you can always do, always do the, fe the fetch of the step after the. Um, and by doing this, by making very wide uh, pipelines, you can increase throughput. Um, is that clear? So let's say I have very linear code. I can already fetch the instructions of the next code we're performing, right? And um, I can fill this whole pipeline. But what if uh, I mispredicted um, a piece of code in a branch, then my old pipeline is, let's say, base bar is larger than foo, and the pipeline is, if bar is larger than foo, we will do bar, but the whole pipeline is filled with do foo. That means the whole pipeline needs to be emptied. And then we need to start by this one. We need to fetch this one. Okay. Um, then we need to fetch. It, it takes one, two, three, four, five, six iterations before we have, oh no, eight iterations before we have the whole pipeline full again, right? Um, what this means is that we can increase throughput. Um, so we can increase sort of parallelism at the CPU level. But if we make a mess, a missed prediction, um, the old pipeline needs to be cleared and needs to be filled again. And this filling of the pipeline, um, yeah, there's a latency on that, which we cannot, um, it takes CPU cycles before the pipeline is full again, before we're on full throughput. So what we need to do um, is write code that has as less branches as possible. So an if-else statement can be very expensive. If this if-else statement, uh, if the CPU predicts the wrong branch, it, it will take, right? Um, if you have an if-else statement that always, if, let's say bar is always larger than foo, then the CPU will learn that and it will predict the next branch correctly. And then you don't have this latency, right? Is that clear? See some nodding faces? Cool. Um, then there's an important thing, which is called SIMD. Um, with NumPy, we are spoiled because we get that out of the box. But what SIMD is, is a single instruction, multiple data. Um, and <clears throat> there are uh, registers on your CPU that can do a floating point operation, for instance. Instead of on one floating point or two floating point numbers at the same time, it can do it on all lanes of numbers. Um, and the CPU registers, the width of the registers differ. Uh, they go from uh, 64 bits to 512 bits. Um, but um, as you can imagine, as you can imagine, you can get a parallelization, a speed up of like five x or six x. Uh, compared to uh, single instruction multiple data, single instruction single data, which is normal code. But to utilize SIMD, you need to write different code. You need to write um, intrinsics or CPU um, uh, functions spe specifically designed for that CPU. Uh, Polos uses this. If you compile for your native CPU on um, on Rust, you can get the maximum with SIMD instructions supported for your uh, CPU. Um, the binaries that are compiled for Python are very are compiled very conservatively because I want them to run on uh, very old CPUs as well. So uh, we do utilize it, but we don't utilize it as much as we could on Python. Um, <clears throat> oh, I see some questions or. Yeah, branch predictions and CPU uh, branching. Branches code. If you write, if you Google that, you uh, uh, you have a hit. Um, yeah, and a, a bit more about the arrow memory format. Um, it bridges the gap about the relational database systems and the machine learning tools. Uh, that's its goal. 
as I said, it is, it's got cache efficient data structures, which are column oriented. Uh, the data structures are also memory efficient. They lead to uh, low fragmentation, for instance. And the Arrow API is supported by many ling languages, so we can have very cheap inter-process communication. Um, so this is an example of a numeric array in Arrow. Uh, this array encodes this uh, list or this array data. One to seven. Uh, the data is stored in a in a yeah in contiguous memory, um, and we also have a validity bits uh, buffer, um, and this is bit mask. So um, it's only old, old one bit of data, and it uh, represents of the um, the data the data index at that point is valid or not. So in this case, this, this one would be a non-value, and the two would be a valid value, and the three would be a valid value, and the four would be a non-value, right? Is that clear? So this is a very cheap way to uh, encode this null information. If you would do this, for instance, with a Boolean array, a Boolean um, uh, holds, eight, holds uh, eight bits, hold a byte, which is, uh, yeah which would be wasteful because we would need eight times more memory. Um, <clears throat> this is um, uh, an example of how an, um, a string array is um, organized in Arrow. So in this case, we have the array foo bar m, with, which are um, um, separate strings. Um, and they are encoded in, in, in UTF-8 string bytes, so we can get them in, into one large uh, string array. Um, but we need a way to know how this, where does the string start and where does it end, right? So we also have an offset array. Um, and this way we can find the, the correct string values. And we are, again have the validity bits. Um, so this is very efficient in array traversal. It's very cache efficient because I can just traverse the, uh, the array in just linearly. I don't have to make any hops. So it's very predictable for the CPU to load the caches. Um, there's low memory overhead with, with a low fragmentation, but there is also a con. Um, it's expensive to reorder an array, reorder an array. For instance, if I do a join operation, I get join tuples and I need to uh, to um, let's say I need to filter out uh, half of string data, then I need to create a new string array, um, and then I need to copy all those string bytes. And especially if I have very large strings, let's say I have a data frame with commons, common values, um, so then the strings are pretty large, then I need to copy all those bytes to a new array. Um, this is very uh, expensive, um, and there is also a trick you can use to not do, do that, and these are called category encoded arrays. Uh, I have in uh, Polars, and it's also hard to require estimated uh, to estimate the required allocation. So if I parse CSV, I don't know how, how large this um, how large the string data will be. Um, so there can be several reallocations, which are very expensive because I need to recopy bytes. Uh, this is how pandas um, store strings. Pandas are actually Python objects. And a Python object is a boxed memory uh, data, some, a boxed memory reference somewhere in the heap. Um, so the, the Python memory, the Python string array are just pointers to some memory somewhere else. Uh, as you can see, this is very cache efficient for two reasons. Um, yeah, you just need to traverse memory all over the place. You don't know where it's allocated. Um, every every iteration is a cache miss, cache miss. So this will be very expensive, and I think we all know that using strings in in um, um, oh sorry, I got a message. We all know that using strings in pandas is very slow. 
it does have a pro. It's very cheap to reorder the join operations because I don't have to touch this data, this box data, this memory, heap allocated memory data. I can leave it as, it, as is, and I can just reshuffle these indexes. This is very cheap, right? I can just reshuffle these indexes, and I've changed the order of my string array. So that's another pro of this um, uh, of this approach. Another con is heap fragmentation, because if I allocate a string on the heap, uh, they are not um, they are not um, allocated closely together. They all have different alignments, and um, there will be parts in memory that cannot be used. For instance, they won't fit anything here, um, and this leads to a lot of wasted memory. Um, which, um, yeah, is hard to uh, control. Um, <clears throat> this error memory, we can actually use this to our, our advantage to write branchless code. Um, for instance, we have this, nu this numerical array. So we have this, nu this numerical array, and we have these uh, validity bit bitmaps. Um, and let's say I want to uh, apply the function two times x. Uh, you only want to apply this function when this uh, when the data below is non, not non, right? If it's non, I don't want to do that. So the naive way would be writing an if else branch. If value, then two times x. If non, do nothing. Um, but this would be a lot of branches. This would be slow. So what we actually do is just we split the um, the validity bit mask, and we apply the function just over the data, and then we combine it again. We can just separate them, apply the function, uh, and combine the uh, the data again. And so we store the the non bit the non values, um, and we did have a branchless apply. Um, so this is very very fast. Um, another trick is called the filter trick. Um, I really like this one. This is really fast. The filters in, in boilers and arrow are uh, insanely fast. Um, so what you can do is we know that um, um, the null values are just encoded with nulls and zeros, right? Um, and null <clears throat> those uh, those validity, it, it's it's often the case that they come that multiple values are valid after uh, um, after each other. How do you call that? Um, or multiple values are invalid uh, in subsequent order. That's what I want to say. Um, so instead of reading those bits as bits, but uh, in one shot as a uh, 64 byte integer. This is very fast. Reading all those bits as a 65, 45 uh, bit, 64 bit integer, I can take a look up in this table and see uh, how many values are valid and how many values are non -val not valid. Is this clear? Um, but reading all those bits as a 64 bit integer for your CPU is takes only uh, one or two cycles. So you, you have the CPU cycles of just reading one, but one, one value and you get 64 values in best case. In best case, you get 64 values and you know you can skip all those, all the next 64 values. Uh, in the worst case, um, you only have one. So it depends on your, um, on your data layout if you have uh, um, a bitmap of where it toggles, where you have one zero one zero one zero one zero one zero, then it actually has a bit of overhead. But it turns out that in real data you often have bits clustered. You have uh, valid data clustered. So this is a yeah. This makes it very fast. Consecutive. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. And. There's also a thing. Um, um, the next the next uh, slides uh, are about parallel code, and parallel code is something of the last uh, yeah of the last ten years, twelve years, fifteen years. 
because bef before that there was always um, um, <clears throat> people thought oh, we, our software is slow now but in two years it will, it will be fast enough and it was also correct because um, the single thread performance doubled every two years that's that's insane uh, um, so there was not real not a real uh, urge to to write very uh, performance uh, critical code if you could just uh, wait two years. Um, but yeah, since the last uh, 15 years, the, you can see the single thread performance is plateauing um, and the frequency, the clock speed is also plateauing. Uh, the transistors are still increasing, but they will uh, reach physical uh, limits also. The only thing we still can do is just horizontal scale, add more lo uh, logical cores. This means we still have uh, more computing power, but it also means uh, that we need to redesign our algorithms because uh, um, parallel code is written completely different than um, um, sequential code. And it's also not always possible to write parallel or prefer perfectly parallel code. So in the next slides, we're gonna take a look at uh, places where Polars utilizes parallelism. Uh, we do this on several uh, things on, on uh, hashing. Hashing is uh, the core operation of every group by and join operation. We do this on the apply, we will see this later. Uh, we do this on the aggregation. Um, we do this on a projection. Uh, projection is the selection of columns. Um, those can be done uh, uh, embarrassingly parallel. Query execution, um, every branch can be executed in parallel. And uh, for this, we use Ryon. Ryon is a Rust library that utilizes work stealing parallelism. Um, and we have a dedicated thread pool. And that's, um, that was, the dedicated thread pool is started uh, once you start Polars. And um, once it's saturated, it, it will just divide um, the work on the number of threads available. But adding more parallelism doesn't hurt performance because it doesn't spin up more threads than the available cores in your um, in your machine. I hear something. Is this? Uh... Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Embarrassingly parallelism. Embarrassingly parallel means um, this uh, algorithm can be executed in parallel without any uh, complications. It's super easy to parallelize this code. Um, for instance, uh, let's say I want to do a word count on uh, every file in my um, uh, in my folder. Then I can just do this parallel for every file, right? Um, there's no communication needed. If I want to use multiple threads and read from the same file, then they need to communicate how many lines uh, thread one read and how many lines thread two read. So then it's not embarrassingly parallel anymore. Um, this is a group by operation. So in a group by, you split data uh, in groups and then you do, in apply, you do an aggregation function. In this case, we do a sum. And the, once we have made these groups, the apply can be done embarrassingly parallel. There's no, this is super easy. There's nothing hard for us to do. So uh, every um, chance we get for embarrassingly parallelism, we try to uh, to take. Um, the hash table is the core of every group by and join operation. Um, and the hashing, so what a hash, hash table does, it, it it takes some keys, it hashes those keys with a hash function, and then it takes the modulo uh, with the size of that hash table, and that modulo gives you a um, pointer, an index in a, in, a, in a bucket, which is backed by an entry, um, an entry array. So here you see a collision. Um, so the first is on that entry, the second one is uh, the next one, um, if we follow a linear probing technique. 
um, well, this part, the hashing, can be done embarrassingly parallel. There's no, no comp nothing complicated. We can just divide our data over, over threads, do the hashing, compute the hashes, do the hash function. Um, but then we need to store it in one hash table. And there it gets more complicated because um, the reasons for that, uh, I will get to that later. Um, so what we did at Polars is we split this first part from the second part. So the hashing can already be done parallel. Um, instead of hashing in the hash table, let's do it ourselves. And then you just use an identity hash in the hash table. Um, and store an index in the key um, because uh, the hash table also needs to do a, an equality function. And if you have to this index, we can always get back to the, to the data structure backing. Is this clear? All right. Um, so this is, for instance, a way um, we could not uh, do this. So let's say we share this about uh, with two threads. Um, but you can imagine uh, any number of threads here. I just do the, the infographic with two threads. Um, let's say you split the data in half, and every thread gets its data, and every thread builds its own hash table. Um, then we still have a problem. Does anybody see it? <laughs> yeah. It's the same problem as MapReduce. <laughs> That's true. Does anybody see the problem here? Why this is expensive? Yes. So if I split this data, you're right, Jury. If I if I split this data naively on every thread, you will see this this split has got an A and this split has got an A, but we cannot know that up front. So you will see that the index or the the A is gathered in this hash table and it's gathered in this this hash table. But once we go back to the main thread, we still need to make a new hash table to combine those, those keys. Um, so this is a very, so this is fast, this threading, but once we go back to the main thread and we need to rebuild this hash table, we, we still have to copy a lot of data around to still uh, need to do a lot of comparison. So this is a expensive uh, way to go and using this would not give you a speed up often compared to single threaded code. Depend, maybe on a large number of data it will, but it's not um, ideal. This is another uh, option, which is not ideal as well. Here you only do the hashing in threads, and then you uh, communicate to a main thread, and only the main thread builds the hash table, but the main thread, you can only write, um, there is only one, uh, one thread that can write at, at the same time. So there needs to be a mutex that locks uh, the hash table. Um, and this locking and um, multiple threads accessing this da same data structure, this is very expensive. And um, yeah, you have a lot of, you've got high contentions. This is called contention. Um, so this is also not ideal. So what Polars does is uh, a lock free uh, algorithm. In this case, we don't we don't um, um, split the data, but every thread gets all data. Uh, but we make sure that traversing this data is branchless. Uh, no, not branchless, but it's very cheap. It's only a small part of code that needs to be executed. And if the code is very small, that means it fits in CPU um, um, CPU instruction cache and will also be fast. Um, and every thread can build its own hash table, but it can only do that if the hash uh, function combined with the modulo of the number of the thread equals zero. Uh, and this way we can make sure that um, all C's, all C values go to uh, this thread and all A values go to this thread and all B values go to that thread. 
And then we, if we combine them to the main thread, um, we can just uh, act, collect all the hash tables and we don't need to build new hash tables. So this is, uh, this turns out to be a lot faster. And this is the way uh, Polars does uh, parallel hashing in the uh, hash join and in the group by operations. And um, this is also the reason that it, it has got this very fast join in the benchmark. Um, and then we come to the, la to the last optimization, uh, which is don't do anything. <laughs> Make sure you uh, do as less as possible. Um, and we can achieve this by having a query optimizer. And a query optimizer, uh, yeah, you just write your code and the query optimizer, just before you execute your query, uh, will try to uh, change your query, reorder it, just so that it does less work. Um, currently, it's got projection pushdown, predicate pushdown, aggregation pushdown, and aggregation simplification. I will go through projection pushdown and predicate pushdown, aggregate pushdown. I will leave it as is. And expression simplification is, um, for instance, if I take column A and I do it times one, that's the same as column A. So I don't have to do this operation. So that kind of stuff. Um, 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 there are actually quite a lot, but those are very easy to do. Um, and there are some future plans on. Um, more optimizations we want to do. <coughs> so before we go into this, um, I want to talk a bit about relational algebra uh, 101, very simple. Uh, we have got two terms. Projection um, is a bit confus confus confusing, but projection is the selecting, the selection of columns from the table. And this is indicated with symbol pi. Um, and this is, for instance, if we, if we select foo from bar in SQL. Uh, selection is not selecting columns, but it's filtering rows from the table. That's why it's confusing. This is often indicated with the symbol sigma. Um, yeah, and for instance, in this query, this line does the selection, right? Four minutes left. Okay. I'm almost at the end. Um, so, here we have a query um, and we have a data frame. We scan the data frame. A scan is a lazy read. And then we do some filters. We filter where common karma is larger than zero, where link karma is larger than zero, and where the string starts with an A. Uh, yeah, I think you can read this. This is very declarative, much like uh, uh, SQL. And if you have the, you can show the graph in Polars and then you see the, the query plan. And this is the not optimized query plan. Here we see we do a filter, then we do a second filter, and then we do a third filter. Well, actually, doing those filters sequentially is expensive because after each filter, you build a new data frame, you materialize a new data frame, and then you filter it again. So you uh, copy data around uh, too often. Um, and Outpolar optimizes this. Uh, it combines all those filters. And here you see it, here it's in the sigma sign. It shows, it does the sigma at the scan level, which means during the reading of the, the parsing of the CSV, it already filters the data. And this means you will, your memory will be, will be reduced by the prediction, by the, by the predicate ratio. So if you only, if you after your filter only have 10% of the rows, you will only use 10% of the memory. Whereas in an eager read, you will first do the whole read and then you do the filter uh, and then you have a memory spike of the whole data in memory. Um, and there's also no redundant table materialization because we combined this, these filters. Is this clear? And we have, for instance, we also have the query um, optimization projection push down. Push down. Oh. 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 Yeah. Um, here we do a, um, we scan two tables. Here we do a filter and then we join the table. And after the join, we do a select. And um, here we have the not optimized 
query plan, and here we have the optimized query plan. And what you can see is that um, the pi, pi's are the projections. Um, during the scan, only three of the six columns are read, and here only one column is read. So uh, here we have this selection on the end, but they are pushed down the query plan at the scan level, which means data we don't have to load in memory will always be cheaper than data we do load in memory. So, um, and then we also don't have to materialize these uh, columns in the join, which is also uh, a lot cheaper. Um, my last minute, my last minutes. So, <laughs> um, um, yeah, as I said, Polar's, so this was my presentation. I will have a few last words about uh, the project. The future plans are documentation, docs, docs, docs. Uh, I always write more code than then I write, than then I write docs. Um, uh, I want to speed up the group by aggregation. I still uh, got an idea to make these faster. Uh, I want to join add join pruning optimization that we can uh, remove redundant joins if they are from self from the, from the same table in some occasions. Uh, I want to explore out of core analysis, which means we can handle more data than fits in our RAM. Um, and we want to post compile UDFs with Rust receive so that we can uh, have user defined functions which are as fast as they can be. Um, and if you want to contribute, uh, go to the GitHub or just use it and make an issue if you find something because that will increase stability, add documentation, and I will also try to add as much good first issue banners uh, to help you. Uh, Walk through the through the issue, issues. Um, and I think we can go to the questions now. Am I within time? And can we do the questions in? Uh, yes, in we microphone? can do the questions. And I'll stop the recording so that yeah. you can ask your question in private.